Mm. So thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I have a few guiding questions. You're welcome. Yes, <laughs> I have a few guiding questions um, about your journey. Uh, feel free to stop any time and say you want to speak about something more or delve into something deeper or just even like divert if there's something more interesting you feel like you want to share with us. Um, yeah, so to kick us off, I uh, would love to hear about um, your journey and how you started off and how you ended up at Sela and why it was important to you and, and, and how that journey has been uh, so far. Thank you. So my, I first heard about Seva when I was like you, a young student at Harvard. Um, I think it was like 1979 or so. And it was soon after Ila Ben, our founder had won the Mag Sese Award. Uh, which is often called the Asian Nobel. And um, some of my friends at Harvard said, have you heard there's some great things going on with women back in your country? And I hadn't heard. And oh so I mean, uh, we had a women's clearing house in those days at Harvard Yard, which supported women on various issues and so it was from the clearing house that I got this information and so I made it my business to find out and then when I went home in between to India fortuitously my father's younger brother was living in Ahmedabad so I went up and I visited Seva and met Ila Ben and then I met Ila Ben again when I graduated in 1982 and from Harvard and then I was back home figuring out what to do and she said you know we would love to have more younger women like yourself come and join the movement the Seva movement and that kind of stuck with me and then I went back to graduate school and returned with a public health degree and said here I am and she said welcome aboard and that was almost 40 years ago now so that was way back in 1984. So yeah, 36 years ago, almost 40 years ago. And I stayed. And I was hired to start up a community-based primary health care program with SEVA members. Uh, because as I said, I was trained in public health. And it had reached the point at SEVA when, first of all, uh, SEVA was independent of the parent organization, the Textile Labor Association. Um, Seba was still really small. I mean, I think there were just barely 20 staff persons and just two or three of us, a handful of us college-educated young women. And kind of everybody knew everybody and everyone ate lunch together. And um, I... Uh, arrived at a time which was lucky for me because it was then that the members were saying Seva has helped us with access to financial services. We have organized and formed our union and some first cooperatives, but we get sick a lot. And if we're sick so much, how can we ever come out of poverty? Either we are sick or our children are sick or our family members are sick. And so that's why I think I was hired by Ilapte and the team to begin working on health issues. They had done some preliminary health work in terms of diagnostic camps and so on, but not a sort of systematic community-based primary health care program according to women's needs. And when I joined, I was shocked to hear the, from the experience of a small study of Seva Bank that of 500 women who were um, taking loans from Seva Bank and not repaying that regularly as they should, because normally women pay very regularly, they found that 20 women had died. And out of those 20 women, 15 women had died from causes related to childbirth. And this was urban Ahmedabad. No doubt, you know, I'm talking about the late 70s before I had joined Seva. But even then, it was a shocking statistic for us. And the other thing women said was that the other reason we can't pay back our loans is because um, whatever we earn goes in medical bills. There's so much sickness. And so 
when I joined, I first tried to understand what were the issues. And I remember spending six months with two senior Seva organizers, Seva leaders, Agivans, working class leaders, who took me into the informal urban settlements of Ahmedabad. And I just was with the women. I listened and I learned so much. And well, that's how I got started. Well, I, I think it's a very beautiful story. Um, I'm also so shocked that it started when you were so young. And I guess at a time when you had a lot of options and Seva was still small. And I'm sure Eleven is very inspiring, but I'd love to hear your, your um, maybe your decision process of saying, this is where I want to work. And having like the world at your oyster, like what are some of the things that you evaluated and said that Seva is for me, at least um, transitioning out of like undergrad, going to graduate school, and then finally uh, saying I'm, I'm going to take the job? So I think, you know, the time that I studied public health and returned to India, I was very clear I wanted to come back and work and work at the grassroots. And there were very few Indian women in public health. There were some women, of course, there always are trailblazers, but not many in my cohort. Um, and I think that um, I, I had a few other job offers, I remember, and Professor Linton Chen, Marty Chen's our friend and sister, Marty Chen's husband always teases me. He reminded me recently, he offered me a job he was the Ford Foundation representative in India. Mm -hmm. And then there were other action research organizations. Mm -hmm. But a friend of mine said, you know, you're young. And why don't you take up an the offer of an organization like Seva? Maybe it's not a high paid job compared to the Ford Foundation. But what you learn there from the field work, from the grassroots work will remain with you and will serve you in good stead all your life. And the Ford Foundations and the other organizations will be there always. But this opportunity won't come again. And I think that was good advice. And that's why I plunged in and never regretted it. Not for one minute. I walked, I remember the first day I had a new Khadi Sari that was given to me by my mother's close friend. And I had, I was already with my Sari and I walked in the, portals of Seva and the moment I walked in I just said wow this is the place for me so I think I just was extremely fortunate and privileged to spend my professional life or my working life in such an organization in Seva with a mentor like Ila Ben and then later Renana Ben and others and also the wonderful women of Seva, my Seva sisters who taught me everything I knew. I had the book knowledge, I had the theoretical knowledge, but they taught me about life really and what it's like to be an informal worker and to struggle and keep smiling and keep going because what are the way? Um, and so I'm eternally grateful to them. I owe them a huge debt. Everything that I've learned, I learned from them. So Ilabman often jokes that you got a PhD from Shankar Bhuvan. Shankar Bhuvan is a sort of huge, sprawling, informal settlement on the banks of the river where I spent my early months at Seva and just absorbed and observed and became friends with the Seva sisters, actually. Everything I didn't. I'm Indian, but I we speak so many languages. So I didn't have Gujarati, so I learned Gujarati from them. I learned how to do garba, which is the traditional folk dance, to eat extra spicy chutneys. You know the joys and sorrows of their communities and their lives. So it was it was just an exhilarating journey and continues to be so. That sounds very beautiful. Very nice. Um, you mentioned a couple of challenges that you joined the organization to work on, like such as health and maybe more specifically maternal health. Um, how was that journey and process in terms of 
like solving some of these tough issues that uh, women were facing at this time? How did you go about it? Um, and yeah, yeah. the results here. Yeah. yeah, maybe you can speak a little louder, Isabel. I can't hear you very well, but I think I understood what you said. I think you know what for me was both a, a wonderful experience, but also hard and challenging was that whatever I read in public health school, uh, I studied public health at Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health. Whatever I learned there in the books, and I had also taken a year off before that and worked in some slums and with pavement dwellers in Mumbai and particularly on tuberculosis. But whatever I learned in the textbooks, I saw in action. And I think one of the hardest things was to see people die because they were poor, because they didn't have medicines, because they went to the doctors too late. And I remember one of our members, uh, she had TB and we tried our best to get her onto medication, to get her well, but it was too far gone by the time we reached her. So she passed away and left three young children. And that was a very big shock. And there were other shocks in store as well as we went along. Um, I remember another story, which was when we began to work in the villages about an hour and a half away from Ahmedabad. Uh, it was harvest time and there was a young woman farmer with a newborn baby. And... Because there's no childcare, she had administered a little bit of opium to the baby to make the baby sleep. But she was young and an inexperienced mother, and so she gave too much opium. So the child went into shock. The child became cyanosed, became blue, and the mother was just beside herself. Unfortunately, we happened to be in that village at that time. So we said, this child has to be taken immediately to the nearest hospital, otherwise won't make it. And I remember the mother-in-law said, oh, she's just a little girl, you know, we don't have the money and almost saying if she dies, so be it. And then we did a little kind of crowdfunding from the village, everybody contributed, we all contributed. And we rushed that child and her young mother to Ahmedabad and the child was put on oxygen, the child is saved, she's now a young woman with her own baby. And I think, you know, that was a turning point in that village. They began to understand that every life, even of a girl child, is important. Um, and what I understood also was, the cult, apart from the social and cultural norms, was how hard it is for people for, if you don't have money. You want to save your child. You want to take care of your child as best as you can. But you don't have the money. And the huge gap in public health services, because way back then in the early 80s, India's public health system was basically a family planning system because uh, there was a lot of pressure on India from outside donors and from within also uh, to you know, slow down the birth rate and so on and so forth, which of course was an issue, no denying that. But uh, rather than looking at it as a holistic issue of public health of informal workers, and how important public health is for women's economic empowerment. It was this one point, what we call vertical program in public health, just to take care of family planning only, contraception. Um, and I began to see all the linkages, what are now called the social determinants of health, that it's hard for people to be healthy. How can they ever dream of, some measure of well-being if they don't have the basics of life, if there is gender inequality, if they have no work and income security. So all the pieces of the puzzle began to kind of unfold themselves um, before me in, in a way that we had just read about uh, while being a student. And then how uh, I learned in Seva how one by one, all the pieces of the puzzle have to be fit together at once, simultaneously, not one before the other. So it's not like, oh, when one day you'll have work and income security, then you'll have health security. No, you have to work on all those fronts together. Otherwise, there'll never be work and income security or food security. 
So slowly, slowly, those kinds of challenges and, and the logic of working and organizing, as we call it, people at the grassroots level unfolded itself. And that was a very rich experience that I couldn't have got anywhere else. You spoke about a lot of different struggles and um, I think one of the very clear issues is gender inequality. Um, I'd love to hear how that experience was, especially in the 80s and as we transition to a place, of, yeah, I guess 40 years later, where I guess a lot has changed, but I, I, you have seen a very different era, at least in the Indian context. Uh, what were the issues there and how do you think some of these things have evolved or like Sewa has helped uh, change uh, this perception of women in society? So I think, you know, like the rest of the world, the 70s and then later on the 80s, I was still young and a student in the 70s, but the 70s was a great time of churning all over the world and for women as well. That's when I think the women's movement in many countries just took off. You know, there was the uh, women's decade and women's conference in Mexico, which was key actually in the, it was a key milestone in Seva's development, although I didn't know it at the time. And I myself was, you know, beginning to have feminist awakenings and my eyes were being opened, you know, already in the 70s when there were all kinds of struggles. I remember there was one particular case of a young indigenous woman uh, we call tribal or Adivasi. Uh, it was a custodial rape case in the police station and it galvanized the entire country. And for the first time, many of us, myself included, were out on the streets. And I think it, it was fortuitous that Seva was born and registered at that time. Uh, perhaps not a coincidence. Ila Ben herself had been active as in the student movement during our freedom struggle and after. Um, but I think she says that Mexico opened her eyes just as all the happenings back home at, uh, opened my eyes. Um, and I think that when Seva was registered in 1972, I think 1975 was the Mexico meeting. And that's when Ila Ben met Michaela Walsh and Women's World Banking was formed and Seva Bank had already been formed before the Mexico meeting. So all the streams kind of converged and came together. So I think the 70s when Seva was born and when some of us were students was a time of great churning, particularly for women in South Asia and certainly in India. And that continued on till the 80s. And, you know, things that now my daughters take for granted, you know, were all things that were struggled for by, you know, so many generations of courageous women. Uh, to whom again we home, owe a debt, and Seva also owes a debt, because in the, uh, I think it, in 1981, uh, there was a major sort of ideological battle, I would say, between the mother organization, which had given birth to Seva, the Textile Labor Association, and Seva itself, because the TLA's leadership were elderly men who were very patriarchal, and they felt they had nurtured Ila Bhatt. And how come she had become such a strong and well-known, world-renowned leader, and so on and so forth. It was before I joined, but I'm very well aware of, of the history. And the reason I mention it is that it was the women's movement in India which understood the, what was going on and rallied and supported Seva in its darkest hour. And we can never forget that because the traditional trade union movement turned the other way. Of course, the TLA, you know, uh, threw Seva out and Ila Ben out um, and so on. But it was the women of India who understood what was happening and supported and had helped keep us afloat. As I said, this was before I joined, but this history is important. And I think ever since the whole issue of gender equality and struggles against gender discrimination 
have been a very important part of SEVA. In fact, we always say we are a confluence of the women's movement, the workers' movement, and the cooperative movement, and then something more, kind of plus, 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 leading to the whole informal workers' movement. So I think the women's movement has been a huge boost and support to SEVA. I mean, we have felt that sisterhood from the beginning, and we continue to. But I think there are real changes. I think thanks to women organizing all across India, you know, we have much more gender equal laws and policies than we could have dreamed of 40 years ago. There's no question about that, that there's been forward movement. But I would say there's still a long, long way to go. And I think that our strategy, SEVA strategy chosen by Ila Ben and not the early pioneer leaders of SEVA, I believe was a really important one. They chose the route of organizing around work, around economic empowerment, because they understood very well that in a country like India, poverty is the number one issue and the poorest of workers are women. And if you can put a few rupees in, more in their hands, if assets are in their name, then a whole process of social change is triggered And even in the family, if these kinds of assets and extra income is entering, um, it also alters the gender power balance in the family once and for all. Um, So I think, of course, it's not that simple as I'm explaining, and there is also still patriarchy, even in our members' families. But at least the equation and the power balance is disrupted, at the very least. And at the best, the woman has much more voice and control over assets and income if you go the economic empowerment route. And for us, economic empowerment is, of course, not simply work and income security, but also food security and social security, which is healthcare, childcare, insurance, housing, pension, and the basics of life, without which it's impossible for women to come out of poverty Uh, be economically empowered and move towards their dream of self-reliance. So I think we've come a long way, but we still have a long, long way to go, both within SEVA and in the Indian women's movement. A lot of progress has been made. That's very encouraging. Very, very encouraging. I'd love to hear how your, how it was being a leader at such a young age especially in this context, um, given like a lot of the patriarchal beliefs, um, also it being a very small organization and definitely it was growing and there was a, a, a large push, but I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of backlash to, to be part of this organization. Um, and I'd just love to hear experience, how you managed that, how you dealt with it, uh, things that you learned as a young leader and even as you then continue to progress and time went on. Sorry for a minute, the screen froze. Can you hear me, Isabella? Perfectly. Yeah. So, I mean, I think when I joined SEVA, I didn't join as a leader. I just joined as a young person uh, wanting to work, wanting to learn, wanting to absorb, and I just enjoyed so much. All, all the work and the life at SEVA. Um, I think one thing I learned was that Eleven is a unique leader. She gave people a lot of space. She's a very secure person. I've seen now, um, you know, after 40 years of working, uh, that it's very hard to encourage other people's leadership un- unless until you yourself are confident and secure person. Um, generally many leaders like to be the tall leader and not allow other people's leadership to bloom. And so I think her style of leadership is unique and special. And um, I will always be very grateful to her for that. So I think she gave us a lot of space to experiment, to make mistakes, and then to lead. So within a few years, I was quite surprised to find that I was invited to be part of the small leadership team of SEVA, which was then called the Standing Committee. 
a few years after I joined, probably three, four years, three years or so. Um, and that was a really special opportunity because I had my senior sisters who I could learn from and of course, Ila Ben uh, leading the team. But also I was able to contribute some ideas and, and so on. And that, that, was, that, that felt good. <laughs> and then slowly as I went along, um, I was encouraged to take leadership in other ways. For example, I, uh, to set up our health cooperative, I was encouraged to do that. And then I became the secretary of the health cooperative and the, you know, playing a major leadership role in our health work. That was sort of, you know, by 1990, I'd already been by, by six, uh, I'd already been at SEVA for six years then. And then also I was asked to play a leadership role in the childcare work and so on. And so one thing led to another. And then I was even more surprised in 1997 when Ilaben decided, not that she was tired or fed up, but she decided that it was time to hand pass the baton on to younger leadership. I, I found myself as the general secretary of SEVA, which I had not expected um, at all or, or planned for or thought of in any way. Um, and I felt deeply honored and privileged to lead after Ila Ben, although it was a big challenge because following the founder is always a difficult task because you're always going to be compared to her and she's sort of incomparable. Um, and she's the founder and she's she and I am me. <laughs> so I think I was quite clear on that. You know, I didn't worry about, you know, how am I ever going to measure up? Because I said, you know, I have a task at hand. I have the responsibility. I'll do my best. And I have her by my side guiding me. So whenever I needed to, I, I you know, leaned on her and took her advice and just kept moving on and I think it was sort of a, a a challenging time looking back but at the time I was just in there you know when you're in it you just deal but I had just two newborn babies I had twin daughters I had one five-year-old and I had when I took over Seva's leadership as general secretary of the union I had twin daughters who were 10 months old at the time they were under a year old so now I look back I think I must have been mad but um, somehow you find the energy and the strength and I think mainly the inspiration from our Seva members, our sisters who juggle so many balls that mine seem mild in compared to all that they have to do um, and so it went and it wasn't an easy road not because I didn't like what I was doing or because I found it too hard but I think when you come in after the founder, that's hard. Then when you have your cohorts who are at the same level as you and then suddenly you are kind of the leader, that's, that's not easy. It's not easy for them. It's not easy for the person who's leading. But I think we managed a good equation, you know, and settled in after a while. It took a while, but... Um, I think one has to be patient and persistent as a leader. And I've always felt a couple of things as a, lead, a leader or leadership style, you know, apart from patience and persistence, be inclusive, respect everybody and their contributions and try to function in as democratic and transparent manner as possible. Um, always a challenge, always an inner journey and asking oneself where one's reached on that. But just some sticking to some basic principles and honesty as well, honestly admitting where you need help or where you've made mistakes. Well, work hard and do what you can. Special flavor to the task at hand. And each of us has our special flavor from our own personal histories, our education, our background, our personality. That's the exciting thing, I think, about changes in leadership, that each person brings their special interests and features and personality to the task at hand. So 
that's what I did for some years and never looked back. Perhaps if I were to do it again, I would say maybe I'd like to be the general secretary when my girls were a little more grown up. But they say, mom, we don't remember all the craziness and the hectic stuff. So that's just as well. They were too little. Um, and I was also extremely fortunate to have my life partner, my husband, Binoy Acharya, who uh, not only was totally supportive in every way, I mean, it was hardest for him. He had to do a lot of the uh, hard work when I was traveling, taking care of the girls and so on. But because he's also of the same ilk, shares the same values, also works at the grassroots. He understood the importance of, of, of Seva's work and really supported it from the beginning. Way before I was the general secretary of Seva. So um, that was huge. My family was hugely supportive. My mother, my sister, other family members and friends. Then some of my colleagues like Renana Ben, uh, who was like an older sister and was really supportive. So all of these things, you know, helped to strengthen, I believe, my leadership. I believe that leadership is not something that, you know, is some God-given gift, but it actually comes from the inputs of so many. Um, so really, it's not ours to have, it's ours to give. That's so interesting and such an amazing uh, story and how um, all these things came together and all these people have poured into your life um, and as well as you stepping up to to be this amazing leader. It's very inspiring. Um, do you feel like... I, think, I, I think also, you know, the whole leadership culture and style at Seva then encouraged me to do the same with my younger sisters, newer colleagues. Um, so we have this Carter based system in Seva, you know, so always looking back and seeing who's there next to take the baton and who is there next to take the baton after her and after her. And uh, that's what a movement is about. I think what's unique about Seva, it's not simply an organization. It's a movement. Mm -hmm. um, and there are so many autonomous membership based organizations and entities within the movement. They all need leaders to run them. It's not possible for one person to run the whole show. And it shouldn't be. I mean, that's not the model at all. Um, the Banyan tree model is so many aerial routes and each of them is needs leadership. Yeah. Um, and, and so the the model is to encourage as much leadership as possible and especially and i want to emphasize working class women's leadership it's one thing for me people like me who you know have had many more privileges perhaps than even we deserve in terms of education and so on but what about our sisters who've hardly been to school or who may have been to school but have never had even a tenth of the opportunities that some of us have had. Um, so it's their leadership we're interested in building and supporting and strengthening. And then we believe, as Ila Ben taught us, that women like myself, of course there is a role, but our role is more to think about how we can promote working class women's leadership and then from behind play a support role. No, it's it's I, I love it. It's very interesting how leadership, at least in a feminine organization or a movement, is is different from the traditional sense of leadership or what people aspire to in a very corporate world. So it's 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 really nice to hear. Um, and I think another thing that we try to do before I forget, Isabella, is work on collective leadership, and that's a work in progress. I'll be honest, it's not easy because, you know, we're all sisters, we're all women, but we're also human beings, yeah. each of us with our frailties. Um, but the idea of collective leadership, which means it's not one supreme leader, but you have a group of leaders, a team of leaders, 
and also, as I mentioned, leaders for all these different organizations. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to hear what you, what advice you have for younger leaders um, or things that you wish you had done differently or not necessarily done differently, but advice to a younger self. And um, yeah, I would love to hear what advice you would love to impart on us and all the oh, other well, I'd love to hear your advice and fresh ideas. But <laughs> I think <laughs> but I think that um, I think it would be really interesting if younger women like you uh, you know try and develop this idea of collective leadership more. I think women's leadership is different. I think feminist leadership is different. And I think we need different models of leadership in the world today. The model we have, I'm sorry to say, in most countries is that of the supreme leader who is not democratic, who's authoritarian, who's not inclusive, who's majoritarian in outlook. In country after country, we see this. And I think it's a really worrying trend. And I think that if we have this model of leadership, we're going to bring our planet to the brink. We've already brought it to the brink with this kind of model of kind of male leadership. Of course, all men are not like this, I know. Um, but what we need is a leadership which is inclusive, which respects Mother Earth, uh, which you know puts the poorest and the weakest and the most vulnerable in the center as Gandhiji, as Mahatma Gandhi taught us, but we weren't listening. Otherwise we'd have a different world today, I'm sure. World which would have been much more respectful of all and the planet. So those are some general remarks. I think for individual women leaders like yourself, developing leaders, leaders, um, what can I say? I think one of the things I would do differently would be to take some more time off when my children were young. I, I do feel badly about that, I have to admit. And my daughters tell me I shouldn't even give it a second thought. But I do feel that those were special times and I wish that I had taken more time off when they were little. Um, so I encourage younger women to do that. I mean, our careers and our work is important, but we have multiple roles and our roles as mothers is also important. I mean, I know that I did my best. I don't, don't have regrets. I don't feel like I fell short. That's not what I'm saying, but I think I would have enjoyed to spend more time. Uh, but you're young and you're energetic and perhaps one is ambitious as a leader. And so I think I would have, looking back, done that a bit differently. So that's one thing I advise my younger sisters who are developing leaders, young leaders. Um, and also to, you know, perhaps balance a little better. I mean, it's a constant struggle. I don't have any formula or answers. I'm still trying to figure out the perfect balance. But we, particularly as women, play multiple roles. It's interesting. I notice from my husband and other close men friends who are in leadership positions, they don't seem to have any of these issues. You know, I envy them. It's always us who are struggling, feel guilty um, as we juggle multiple roles of a homemaker, a mother, a leader at, in the workplace. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm saying I don't have any answers either. Even 40 years later, I'm still a student in terms of finding the way for all of this. Um, and I think each of us has to find one's own way because each of us is different. Each of us has different thresholds. So therefore, there will never be a formula or a set way or a prescription. Oh, but I guess I always feel like pay attention to your heart as well as your mind. Sometimes I feel that many of us who are educated are a lot up there. <laughs> we need to be a little bit more in the heart, I think, perhaps. And the other thing that I always say to my young colleagues is spend as much time as you can 
in the field, at the grassroots, with women, with local people, with men, with families, because that's the greatest teaching of all. That not only gives you fulfillment and deep work satisfaction, but it will give your life direction, sort of getting your hands dirty, so to speak. I find that a lot of younger women spend a lot of time in the office on the computer. And I'm thinking, what is going on there? You know, at least in public health. <laughs> public health is all about praxis. Why do you need to be on your laptop? You need to be out there, you know, uh, in the trenches, frankly. Um, that's where it's at. So, you know, I would say, to young and emerging leaders, spend as much time as you can at the grassroots in the field because those days don't come again. Because slowly as within organizations and movements, as you develop as a leader and if you will move up the rung or whatever you want to say, you'll have less and less time to spend at the grassroots. And certainly that's my first love. That's you know, where I'm happiest when I'm with the women at the grassroots, learning from them, singing with them, dancing with them. And those times don't come easily anymore. Oh, it sounds Certainly great. Not <laughs> <Good> sure. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes. Um, no, I, I'm very grateful and it's, it's very inspiring uh, to hear this process and also understand it's a journey. Um, and it's a period of self-discovery. I'm conscious we are on the mark and I don't wanna take any more of your time, um, but I, I wanna leave it open. If there's anything else you want to say or share with us, uh, okay. No, I, I think, you know, I'm almost, you know, in another five years I'll retire, which to me seems uh, quite a shock. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I'll continue working in some way, but I'm getting ready to pass the baton on. And I'm proud of my younger colleagues like Mithal and others who are perfectly capable. You know, they'd be able to take the baton right now. Um, but they say, no, hang on a bit more. <laughs> so I'm happy to work with them. Um, and well, as I said, it's been an exhilarating journey and I, I feel incredibly fortunate to have found direction and to have come across Seva and well I hope I can continue to contribute for a few more years and help other women also reach their fullest potential and enjoy themselves as much as I have all these years. It's very inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> If you have any last questions, you're welcome to us. No, I, our, our last question is mainly advice to us and just reflecting on the things that you would have done differently. So we do appreciate this. Um, I really enjoyed listening to your story and I feel like we've only scratched the surface, but I'm so grateful that I've had this experience and I'm very excited to share this back with the team. Yeah, they'll be very sure. excited. Sure, most welcome. And will you be continuing with us in the meetings or now you're done within um, our going? Yeah. Unfortunately, yesterday was my last day, um, but uh, I, I will attend a, a couple of things, but not in the same capacity um, as before. Yes. But it was beautiful just even being on the workshop calls and just seeing how inspired or how motivated and how people are eager to solve these problems was definitely a a very inspiring and motivating experience yeah thank you so much Mary ben. good not at all and Isabella you live in the U.S. or in no I am from Kenya uh, Kenya yeah yes. that's what I thought yes, yes so I'm... are you now in Nairobi or what mm, I'm still in uh, Cambridge uh, just because of uh, school and COVID um, yeah but yeah, I'm just here for school. But I lived in Kenya before, and I'm not sure I will be after, but all my life I have been in Kenya. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Love the African continent. In the last five, seven years, we've been working much more on the continent, 
not so much in Kenya, but Tanzania next door, Ethiopia, Mozambique. And it's been wonderful. We've been really privileged to share with our sisters in those countries and we're in touch with them. So I had a lot of, we've had a lot of interaction. They've come, we've gone. It's been just wonderful. Mm. So we hope in post-COVID world we can pick up the pieces. No, for sure. And it'll only like continue with like more, more uh, motivation and fire because I think your people have been very inspired. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maria Ben. Thanks, Isabella. Good luck. All the best. Thank you. All the best to you and stay safe. Okay. Bye.